to the Bed Central podcast powered by Bedcoza. I'm your host, Mitch Makiana. We are back again for yet another week of Premier League action, joined by incredible analyst Grant. As things kick off this weekend with his team, Chelsea taking on West Ham, of course. Chelsea coming in clutch with two of the individuals coming off the bench and securing a victory for the Blues. They take on a West Ham side that we've been saying, Grant, for a while now. Squab death has been key. They look good as a team. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how, you know, they take on this Chelsea outfit. Yeah, look, Chelsea burgled the win last week against Bournemouth, uh, needing, as you say, a moment of quality from Jadon Sancho to set up Nkunku. Uh, Sancho made a big impact and Nkunku, you know, he's a very good finisher. So, yeah, it was a bit of burgled victory because Robert Sanchez gave away a penalty and then saved it and Bournemouth hit the woodwork twice and their pressing led to a lot of first-half chances. And yeah, there's still a lot of work for Enzo Maresca to do with his team to to get a good balance. There should be a few players back, Malagusto and Enzo Fernandez and so forth. So there should be I have more quality in the eleven because Axel Di Sassi struggled, Renato Vega struggled as well in midfield. So Chelsea should be in better shape. And West Ham, I mean, they're still kind of on a hangover from last season. They they only got two wins in their final eleven league games. Moyes got sacked this season. You know, Lopet, um, Lopetegui's taking a while to get his ideas across especially because they're giving up a lot of chances to teams. Um, you know, so like against Man City, they conceded 23 shots and 3 XG. Against Fulham last week, I mean, Fulham had 21 shots and four big chances. So West Ham's defence and their defensive midfield is not quite protect, you know, protecting their, their goalkeeper very well at the moment. Um, so I think Chelsea should have enough to score a goal or two. But at the other end, you'd expect West Ham to also score based on the chances Chelsea are giving up. So, I mean, I think probably a score draw is a, is a likely result. The other thing as well is that West Ham at home tend to do well in this fixture. They've only lost once in their last seven home games against Chelsea yeah. with four wins. So with that derby factor as well, you could see that the West Ham's getting something from the game. So, I mean, a draw at 3.7 is great value. Otherwise, you could go both teams to score and over 2.5 goals. That's 1.76. It's a bit safer. Um and if, if you're looking at scorer markets, I mean, I know you love Bowen. I'm from from my side, and Kunku could be a good bet because yeah. he's two point nine, and his record is actually pretty good. It's with when he actually gets on the pitch for Chelsea, he scores quite regularly. So you could be one to look at uh, from that perspective. Now let's move on over to uh, bottom of the table clash: uh, Southampton, Ipswich. Both of the new boys in the Premier League are obviously eyeing this fixture as a must win. And I mean, even the odds speak to that Southampton at 2.25 straight win, Ipswich at 3.15 for a straight win and a draw 3.40. Um, look, I think again, you know, me score a markets where I like to go. I think Delap, who is a man city, a graduate academy graduate. He's been very, very good for Ipswich. I can definitely see him doing something. I'm still not confident in Southampton, especially their defense. Um, I think they play good football, but for some reason this season, it's like they haven't been as defensive as they've needed to. So therefore, they've been getting caught on the break. And I think, look, Ipswich has shown glimpses of they can, you know, hurt teams um, in the transition. So, yeah, that's where I'll probably look at it. Maybe over 1.5 goals. I think there'll be goals in this because I think, yeah, both teams are going to look to go for it. Yeah, it feels like almost a must win for both teams where like a draw is not of any use. So you'd expect both teams to throw throw bodies forward. If Switch have got two really good results in a row, they drew with Fulham, they got a draw away at Brighton when we all thought they'd get beaten quite heavily. Yeah, they gave up 21 shots and, and were a little bit fortunate to, to escape with that result. But And then, of course, a draw against Fulham as well um, was a good result at home to, to get something on the board. And Saints, they in the week they played in the Carabao Cup, so they... They um, end up getting past Everton on penalties, but um, yeah, they got a draw away at Goodison. It's not a bad result, and there was quite a few changes for Russell Martin. He, you know, sort of mixed up his team a bit. I saw um, so the highlights reel of Leslie Ogutchuku's performance, and he looked brilliant in that holding role. So hopefully yeah. he can continue that. But yeah, on a on a on a kind of a prediction front of how it will go. I mean, I expect there'll be goals for both teams. Um, Southampton are probably going to have a lot of the ball, but Ipswich will hurt them on the break with their, some of their speed that they've got. Ogbené, for example. So, uh, probably goals, uh, like back in the goals market, I think over 3.5 goals, 2.8. That's pretty yeah. decent. Um, 
Otherwise, you could go for something like maybe Southampton double chance and then add in the, the goals because there's a chance that they don't win at home. They, they Again, they might play a lot of good football. Even against the, against United, they did that, but didn't didn't get anything. So Southampton or draw and like over 1.5 goals is like 1.68. I think that's quite a safe bet. Um, yeah, those type of things I'd go for, but I'm not 100% sure which team's taking the, the big trio. Now let's move over to a team that managed to bounce back last night in the League Cup, but I mean their performance against their rivals in the North London derby left a sour taste in the mouth of fans. That's of course Tottenham. They take on a Brentford side who will be without Visa. I think he, him, and Buemu have this amazing duo strike partnership, which is incredible. I think Tottenham will be happy that they don't have to deal with him. But, of course, Tottenham also need to sort out their scoring because it seems like they're struggling to put the ball in the back of their net. They're getting into good areas, and Dominic Solanke still needs to open up his account just to build that confidence. And I do think this could be a game that that could happen, you know. But it, we might even see a Thomas Frank that probably plays a little bit deeper. Uh, but they're going to struggle. I, I don't see Brentford struggling because they won't have an outlet like Visso, who's been so good this season so far. So I'm leaning over to a Spurs win, but I don't think the goals are going to be crazy. Yeah, it's, it's it's a huge blow for them to lose, obviously, their Congolese forward, because, as you say, he's got a great understanding with Mbuemo, and they're both really good at their, their jobs. Are kind of like, they're kind of like half-wingers. They play wide, but they also come into the centre a lot. So maybe someone like Fabio Carvalho can, can be a benefit. It can be the beneficiary and get some games now after he's moved from Liverpool. I think that would work quite well to get him more involved. There's obviously yeah. Kevin Schade, who's their record signing, or was their record signing, who's probably going to take that spot. And yes, as you say, Spurs against Arsenal were very disappointing. They had lots of possession. They had some chances, but not very many. And basically after the first 15, 20 minutes, Arsenal were comfortable. I mean, they let Spurs have the ball and it was very passive. And then Postacoglu just threw on a bunch of speed merchants trying to hope something will come off. Threw on Timo Werner and Odebert and he had Johnson and, he, you know, Madison playing deeper and yeah. whatever. He was trying everything, but they didn't really create much. So I think teams that are disciplined defensively can let Spurs have the ball to an extent and, yeah, just not give away count, too many counterattacks. Then Spurs are a little bit toothless. And Brentford are the type of team that have beaten Spurs in the past and could do a good job on them. As you say, they, they usually play more defensively in the big games. Um, so they might sit in and just let Spurs have the ball and then play on the break. They've still got Mbwemo's speed and other, and other pacey players. So I think they could probably get something at Tottenham. If they, if they do lose, it's going to be by, probably by one goal margin. Um, yeah, and I said last week with City, you know, they probably win by two goals against Brentford. It was only a one goal margin. And Brentford actually, quite for one rare occasion, played a back four in, in one of these big games. So maybe yeah. they'll be positive and as well. So quite a hard one to call from that perspective. So, I mean, I'm kind of leaning towards a draw. I think Brentford can get something. But I think if you want to go for a risky bet and make some cash, you could go Tottenham to win by exactly one goal, 3.75. That could be an option. Or look at scorer markets. You're going to, it's much easier now without, without Wissa. It's just going to be on Buemo. And then probably Son and Solanke are the ones to look at from the other side. So there's a few different options, but I think Spurs yeah. can slip up again. Now, let's chat about Fulham, who will play host to Newcastle. I mean, Newcastle is just one of three teams that are still unbeaten in the Premier League, which is... Oh, no, no, I got that wrong. No, no, there's still a few more teams that are unbeaten in the Premier League. But, of course, Newcastle have only, have won three and they've drawn one. Um, again, their away form is still a bit iffy for me because you saw what happened last week against Wolves. The Wolves went up, uh, and, of course, because of the bangers that they scored afterwards. They, they do look okay, but I think this Fulham team, which is growing in confidence um, with a good um, yeah good team, good group of youngsters who are all looking to redeem themselves. Reese Nelson's obviously on loan. He scored in midweek. Um, there's some cool, good pu puzzle pieces for Marco Silva to work with. And to be honest with you, I I'm, leaning at a, I'm leaning at a Fulham win straight, 2.80. That's where I'm going. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, they have a lot of good footballers now. You mentioned Reese Nelson and Iwobi and Smith Rowe, all that Arsenal connection. Um, they've got Pereira, they've got Muniz, they've got actually some really nice attacking players. And you can see them playing nice football this season. They would have been gutted to concede in the 95th minute against West Ham last week. 
they deserve to win that home game. They they dominated there. As I say, I said earlier, they had twenty one shots and four big chances. West Ham didn't create a whole lot, so they should have won that fixture. Maybe they're still a little bit too open as a team, so opponents can nick a goal against them even if they're being dominated. So that is a slight concern, especially against Newcastle, who don't need possession to, to you know to actually win matches. Last week, last week uh, Newcastle were bad in the first half, and they had to change it up in the second half with a triple substitution and. They yeah they brought in Joe Woolock and Sandro Tonali and Harvey Barnes all at the break, and it made a big difference. The second half they were they were dominant and got the win in the end. I mean, if sucks would have injured last week, I'm not hundred percent sure, certain on his status, and that's always a problem because you can't really bank too much on Wilson. So yeah, it's suck. Um, he's got some sort of eye injury. He, I think he's he's about fifty fifty for this game. Um, to, to you know to come back, so it might be worth seeing the lineup. But I just think the way the teams play, Fulham are quite open, Newcastle are quite counter-attack based, so Newcastle might get quite a bit of joy in this game. Um, so I might lean more towards Newcastle, you lean towards Fulham. I mean, yeah, let's see. Next time we record, who you know who got it right. <laughs> Come on. Uh, now let's move on over to Leicester, Everton. Of course, Everton haven't been having a great season. They've been struggling, also got knocked out of the League Cup as well. Those penalties were crazy. Uh, Leicester, on the other hand, yeah, I think they could do a job over Everton. Um, we'll just have to wait for Everton to go 2-0 up, and then we know what's going to happen. But it's a must-win for both teams. I think we've put it plainly, but more so for Everton because the pressure is obviously piling up on Troy and Deitch. Uh What do you think? I'm going with the Jamie Vardy anytime goal scorer. That's, that's where I'm leaning mm. to. Yeah, it's a tough one. This is a, an early relegation battle. You know, Everton have no points and Leicester have two points from four games. And last yeah. week they should have won the game and end up drawing. I think they feel like they basically felt like, you know, that was a loss basically because even though they got a point, I thought, you know, when having been 2 up, they, they, sh- they, sh- they should have seen that out um, against Palace. So, yeah, it's a hard one to, to figure out because Everton have a ton of injuries as usual. Um Branthwaite is still out. Uh, Nathan Patterson's out. Seamus Coleman, doubtful. Mikalenko was yeah. ill in the week. Covered L- Lewin and James Garner was also sick, so they missed out. And Tarkovsky's carrying like a lower back glute injury. So I, I, if Everton are like a bare bones in defence, um, even more so than they've been in recent weeks, yeah, I wouldn't back them. They just don't. They've been leaking goals for fun. So I, yeah, I think you might be right. Vardy could get quite a bit of joy in this game. Even though Everton also deep. I mean, he can exploits even if there's not space to exploit he's quite good around the box with you know quick shots so yeah this physical list could get at least a point if not a win i think maybe a Leicester straight win at 2.55 looks quite tempting yeah. i just don't trust everything and i think daish is on his he's he's kind of dead man walking if there's a takeover i think they will look to bring in someone else let's move on over to uh aston villa taking on walls um again i'm going <laughs> <laughs> this for me, it's probably going to be a Villa over two point five goals. Uh, I'm sorry, over one point five goals. Two point five sounds crazy, but I think Villa. You look at that attack, man. Um, they did well in Europe. Finally, they are back, and they just look so good. Because if Ali Watkins doesn't do it, oh, there's John Duran coming off the bench, and he started the season like a man on fire. That midfield is exciting. I think more um, Morgan um, Morgan in the midfield. We've got uh, Jacob Ramsey, Onana, even Tillemans is chipping in as well. Uh, there's a solid base there. Some good attackers. Yeah, I can't see Wolves doing anything against them. Yeah, probably not. I did see Watkins with you know his ankle uh, sort of with ice on it in the week. Um, so I don't think that's a serious injury. I mean, you, you mentioned John Duran. He's been just brilliant to watch this season. I would really want to see him and Watkins play proper minutes together. They played 15 yeah, minutes together in the last league game. But they, they're they generally sharing the minutes. I really want to see them to maybe start a few games as the front two. But then you mentioned Rodgers has been playing so well behind Watkins. Um, yeah, so it's a game that you expect Villa to win. You know, Wolves play decently. They Most games this season they've played quite well in. They played well against Chelsea for half. They played well against Newcastle for the first half. Both those games, they fell apart in the second half. It's just because they don't have that quality in the back, the back anymore without Max Kilman, and I think that's just a, a quality factor. So they probably will play decently, and I'm always a bit worried about teams who are new to a higher level, like Villa are new to the Champions yeah. League. 
Mm. Now they have to play a league game. Will they be completely focused on or not? That's kind of the question. And it's a kind of a Midlands derby. So there's a few different little red flags that maybe Villa might, might slip up. Um, so, be, so from that perspective, I think 1.58 on a straight win is not like safe enough. You know, if it was better odds, it maybe would be worth backing, but this is like not even great odds. It might ruin a, a ticket for you. Um, so yeah, I think I'd have to get some better odds within that, even if like maybe Villa and over 2.5 or something, um, just to get better value. At least you know that you, you know, if you're backing them, it's worth it. You're not just putting money on a low, a low odds game. But yeah, so I think Villa will win, but it's there's some banana skin factors here. Yeah, now let's move on over to Liverpool, Bournemouth. Uh, Liverpool bouncing back midweek in Champions League, beating uh, AC Milan, taking on Bournemouth side, who have some attacking players. But again, I don't see Liverpool losing two at home, to be honest with you. And I think it's going to be a case of probably where I'll, I'll use a little bit of in-game betting. Because, I mean, was it last season when they won 9 0? But there was a season where Liverpool beat Bournemouth 9 0 in this exact fixture. Um, and Mo Salah didn't score, which was kind of crazy. But I think it's going to be definitely one I'm going to maybe, yeah, approach with in game betting um, and just look at what the lineups are, how they're playing, and then make some of my decisions based on that. Yeah. Yeah, it could be worth doing that. I mean, we didn't expect Liverpool to slip up last week against Forest. I mean, I said Forest would probably make some changes and be a bit more defensive in their lineup. They just packed their team with central midfielders and blocked off the centre of the pitch and then brought in Hudson Adoy and Ilanga in the second half to, to win the game. And they were great impact subs. And I mean, Liverpool looked pretty toothless. They looked tired from the international break and Salah was off his game. But they bounced back in pretty good fashion against AC Milan. I mean, the XG of that game is crazy. I mean, 3.09 for Liverpool, 23 shots, five big chances. I think you can say that they they had a bit of a palate cleanser and that Forest game is out of the system. And Bournemouth, despite playing well against Chelsea, they, they, they do have a defence that can be exposed. There's a lot of last-ditch defending, you know, from Senesi and Zabani. Uh, so teams are, like, often close to scoring goals against them and they just manage to make a block or whatever. So Liverpool will get some space to enjoy uh, more than they'd get against Forest, who were smart and played defensively. Bournemouth probably won't do that. So I think Liverpool will have space and will win by a goal too. Um, so Liverpool on the handicap to get some value, uh, minus one, one point is 1.76. That's basically yeah. the, the earliest point you're getting any value. Otherwise, you have to look at Salah and the scoring market. He's gone two games without a goal. He played well against Milan but didn't score. So Salah maybe any time at 1.76 or <clears throat> you could back him as the first goal scorer at 4.2. Uh, there's, there's two different options. But yeah, I think Liverpool will probably win like, you know, 3-0 or 3-1 or something like that. Let's go to Palace United um, playing each other this evening to all to wrap up the Saturday evening fixtures. United with a massive seven 0 win. Who saw that coming against League Two side uh, Barnsley? Uh, Palace, on the other hand, it's been an okay start, but it wasn't as good as how they ended last season. But I mean, you can see that they're going to pick up momentum. United, of course, have been putting some good shifts. Obviously, they, they could have conceded um, last week, but because of the amazing penalty save from Monana, it kind of gave some energy to the team for them to go on. What do you make of this one, Grant? How, how are you calling it? Yeah, United against Southampton, they were pretty much outplayed for the first 30 minutes and then scored and kind of controlled the game after that once they were in front, um, as you can do against Southampton. And Palace, I think, yeah, they they, they got a draw last week. Mateta scored twice. He's scored so many braces in the last six months. It's crazy. I mean, if you've been backing him to score two or more goals, you were making, you would be making so much money. Uh, Eddie yeah. Nketiah scored in the week as well, so against Crystal Palace, and so did Eze. So that front three, assuming they all play again like they did last week, will yeah, we'll kind of gain an, an understanding as time goes on. Um, so we'll also got new defenders and so forth. So it's going to take a little bit of time to bet in. I mean, of course, Palace won this fixture 4-0 last year uh, towards the end yeah. of the season. Absolutely schooled United. My coalition is there just running right. And, um, you know, Eze could cause a lot of problems for United again because they're probably going to have Casemiro, Ugarte, or Menu. There's going to be space around those those players. So, yeah, I think Palace have a decent chance of, of getting another win at home. They often get points against United in home games. 
against big teams in home games at least. And it's a six thirty game, so it's a bit, you know, a bit of colder temperature, more of an atmosphere. Yeah. So I, th- I mean, I fancy Palace to actually win this game. Um, they've been a bit iffy this season, but a big game can kind of focus you a bit. Um, uh, two point eight. Uh, I kind of fancy them. Mateta, Ketia, and stuff can cause real issues for for that United uh, back six, which is not very, it's not very compact. And yeah, I think Palace might win. Now let's move on over to uh, Sunday. Brighton hosting Forest. Forest, of course, coming off that incredible win away from home at Anfield. Uh, Brighton, on the other hand, of course, we know the talent that they possess. How good they can be. I don't know. I don't. I don't know. I might just avoid this game because I don't know how to bet on it. Yeah, it's weird because um, the teams are on the same amount of points: two wins and two draws after yeah. four matches. Forest have had an amazing unbeaten start um, to the season. They have a lot of good players. You know, you love Hudson Odoi. I think he's, he's also very good. He's much better than Mudrick. Anyway, Chelsea sold him for like four million pounds to Forest. Uh, they got Ilango, yeah. who's a really good player. Chris Wood's been scoring regularly. You know, they've got um, Gibbs White and other quality players. So they can hurt teams. And Brighton were would have been very disappointed not to beat Ipswich last week. I think many people thought that could be three or four nil. So it is, it's become quite a difficult game to bet on. I think you're going to expect Brighton to have a lot of possession and Forrest to sit back and use the counter-attacks. They have a good practice of that way at Anfield last week, so it's not like the plan's going to be unfamiliar to them. They just have to press repeat. So, yeah, it is a slight banana skin for Brighton and a difficult one for you to kind of predict. Like maybe a game I'm going to stay away from because I think this could be a draw. Or it could be one of you know Forrest nicking it or Brighton winning by one goal or something. So I think I'd rather just stay away and and see what happens, especially because Brighton's fullback areas are one of their weakest positions. They're playing Henshaw yeah. there, and Estupinan's not being totally totally fit. So with when you've got the Hudson Odoi and Ilanga who are fresh and keen to prove a point after last week, um, yeah, there's too many factors here that make me not want to back Brighton um, without too much risk. Now let's go to the final one. It's the big one: Manchester City taking on Arsenal. Now I'm looking at. Uh, the information that we received from previous games. The last one was a normal draw. The game before that, Arsenal won one nil. So I, I don't expect a goal fest. I think Saliba and Gabriel have done really, really well um, over the pro- previous meetings on containing Haaland. So I do think it's going to be a case of, you know, you can you can bank on under 2.5 goals. I think that that's a possible guarantee. I don't think there'll be more than two goals in this game. Yeah, I think it's that's a very likely call. Uh, Arsenal played quite defensively in both games last year. They got some criticism by the when it got to the end of the season <clears throat> and they didn't win the league. People said they should have been more open against City and try to win the match. They got a non yeah. draw, and I think City had one or two shots in targets. As you say, Haaland was in the, the pockets of those two defenders. And Kevin De Bruyne got some sort of injury against Inter Milan, and there's a doubt. We are recording before Arsenal play Atalanta. So there's a few factors that Arsenal have an extra, uh, they have one less rest day. They could get injuries in the Atalanta game. They also have to travel back, um, where City have, they kind of saved energy against Inter. They didn't really push too hard to win the game. Yeah. And I think that gives City an edge. And yes, Arsenal did uh, avoid defeat in the last two games, but they, I think they lost 12 in a row before that to City. I think for them, it's just a game not to lose. Uh, at this stage, if City had a perfect record and Arsenal to really drop four points, uh, you know, it's a long way back to catch up four points on City. So for Arsenal, I think a draw would be a good result. Uh, be quite defensive as they were against Spurs. Of course, Declan Rice is fit. So yeah, they'll be nice and compact. And I think they probably will kind of escape a bit from the Etihad with a point and just move on with life, um, you know, with other games, you know, deciding the title less so than the direct matchups. So, yeah, I think there'll be few goals. Under 2.5, as you say, is 1.8. That yeah. might be the best bet that there is because it's quite good odds and probably no, no, one, no, either way, 1-1. One, one. So, yeah, I think that's a good bet. Uh, otherwise, a draw itself, uh, 3.6. Or you could back Arsenal on the, just the double chance if you think they might even do something and win the game. You can get t- uh, 2.0 on tie or Arsenal. Yeah. So a few different options. Um I think there's a few spanners in the works with the Bruins injury, the rest days, and so forth. So maybe a bit of a disappointing, like a disappointing spectacle uh, in the end. 
Well, there we go. That's how we wrap things up. That's the final game for this game week. Let us know how you'll be betting by simple, simply tagging us at BetCoza. Myself and Grant will be back next week to give you all the latest action. So we'll see you then. Have yourself a great one. I've been Mitch. That's been Grant. Peace. 